over 350 poems. And he is entered every year in the AOPA Art and Writing Contest. That's what the framed piece is up here. That was his last year's entry. Um, so he decided that today he would love to share with you some of his poems from his new book. Now, I said he'd be reading them, but of course, those of you who know Rob know that he doesn't see real well, so he actually has them all memorized. So he will be reciting them. And then afterwards, you'll have a chance to look at his book, and he has both the hardbound copy and um, the softbound copy available for purchase and signing. Now, I'm sure you're all wondering what the bright light is in the back of the room and the man with the camera. Rob's uh, publisher, who happens to be his nephew, contacted Norm Silverman, who has a production company here in town, and asked him to come and videotape this so that they can put it on the website and use it for further publicity. So we're really high tech today. We have, we have this big production company here doing a video. And of course, we have Rob with his poetry. So I'll turn the program over to Rob. Thank you very much, Lucy, for the lovely introduction. It has been about, I think, nine years since I appeared in the convocation room here. In those days, the people that knew me were hanging on the rafters. I think I filled the whole thing. <laughs> Today, I'm so pleased to see that you came to hear this poetry and the talk that I am going to give about it. It will be divided into three parts. The first part is just a general introduction. The second part will be the poetry of really great poets so that you can appreciate what great poetry is. And the last part, which will be the bulk of the program, will be from the new book entitled personal perception. Some years ago when I published a few poems in a newsletter, people would come up to me and say, how do you do that? You're always ready with the words and, and then put them into poems. So what's your, your recipe? And that gave me the idea of giving my poetry and the way I create my poetry, a new way to express it by comparing it to a recipe. For in a recipe, the chief of all the chefs in the world, of what, what there are legion, their raw material is out there, and it's anything that is edible or palatable, and their creative ability to make it taste good and be attractively presented, whether it's animals, or fowl, roots, trees, nuts, vegetables, whatever. It depends on the artistry of the chef as to whether you will like it or not, even include the nuts and the, the spices. Well, poetry is not exactly like that. In the first place, the raw material of all poetry is what's in the dictionary. But what's in the dictionary is very soon reduce, reduced when you think of what it needs to do as far as you are concerned. And it is reduced into a vocabulary. That's your personal contribution as far as words available are concerned. Now you take those words out of your vocabulary and you wrap them around your brain so that you will enhance them with figures of speech, grammar, syntax, similes, metaphors, analogies, alliteration, synecdoche, onomatopoeia, personification, any number of the usual uh, features of, of the 
making of a different kind of an approach to communicate in poetry. Poetry, said Robert Frost, begins with delight and ends with wisdom. It must ride as a piece of ice on a hot stove on its own melting. And so with any poem, it is most successful when it is dealt with by the poet truthfully so that he comes through and he keeps the context, the meaning, the theme true to his own philosophy. Now we go to think about the great poets of the time, and I throw these in here, or have chosen them because they are truly great. And the first of those would appeal to all of us because he was the one that addressed himself in the first person as an old man. And what he said appeals to us because at the time he was less than somewhere between 40 and 52 when he wrote the sonnet 73. His name is William Shakespeare, born in 1564, and he died in 1616. And this I am referring to is Sonnet 73. You will relate to it. Listen to it carefully. That time of year thou mayest in me behold when yellow leaves, or none or few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs, where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire as on the ashes of its youth doth lie, the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed by that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest which makes thy love more strong, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. Two years after Shakespeare died, a young man, a boy was born in 1618. He grew up to be a soldier and a very likable guy. He had a girlfriend, and it was during the wars in England. Born in 1618 and dead in poverty in 1658 was the poet Richard Lovelace. He wanted to go to those wars, so he wrote a poem to Lucasta on going to the war. Tell me not, sweet, I am unkind, that from the nunnery of thy chaste breast and quiet mind to war in arms I fly. True and new mistress, now I chase the first foe in the field, and with a stronger faith embrace a sword a horse, a shield. And yet this inconstancy is such as thou too shalt adore. I could not love thee, dear, so much loved I not honor more. We skip ahead to the 19th century. In 1809, when Edgar Allan Poe was born. He had the sorriest, most unfortunate life of any man alive. He loved his mother, who was the most beautiful woman of the world at the time, born when, he was, when she was only 15. And uh, she was an actress, and her husband, David Poe, had left her. So she was working in Richmond, Virginia at the age of 16 or 17 as an actor, actress in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. So in order to make a living, she wrapped her baby in a blanket and put him in the center of the first row in the theater every night, six days.